Hello everyone, welcome to an academy. You are listening to a course on the comprehensive understanding of Delhi Sultanate, Bahmani Kingdom and Vijayanagara Empire. And this would be the lesson number 7 which speaks about the Tughlaq dynasty. This course is presented to you by Nitin Kune Parambal, that would be me. These are the details here. You also know the course on an academy is absolutely free. But then you are also allowed to make your voluntary contribution as a piece of appreciation for the, all the hard work that people like us do. You can also follow me on an academy in the link below. Okay, a small recap before we enter into Tughlaqs. You had seen how great a person Alauddin Khalji was. We spoke about his character sketch. We spoke about the reasons why he had maintained all this thing, how ambitious a loader he was. But then we also saw that he was followed by a few weak rulers like Mubarak Khalji, which led to the collapse of Khalji dynasty. Now what next? And the answer is the Tughlaq dynasty. While uh, preparing for the Tughlaq dynasty, you should understand there are three important figures when it comes to the Tughlaq dynasty. The first one being Giyasuddin Tughlaq, who ruled for four years from uh, 1321 to 1325. Then you have uh, Muhammad bin Tughlaq, who ruled from 1325 to 1351. That's a long 26 years. And then you have Firosha Tughlaq, who ruled for 37 years from 1351 to 1388. So that means a very long period. Right, And mostly, uh, the failure of Sultanate is attributed to this person who is Firosha Tughlaq and this person Muhammad bin Tughlaq. We'll inspect in a greater detail later, but uh, now first let's get started with Giyasuddin Tughlaq. Now, Ghazi Malik was his actual name. He, rever he reversed almost all the policies that Alauddin Khalji has done with respect to bringing down this Kharaj, the revenue collected from 50% to 33 percentage. Also, he made Tughlaqabad fort in Delhi. But uh, most interesting thing about Tughlaq is the story, what he, the legend, what is shared between Yasuddin Tughlaq and Nizamuddin Aliya. Now, when we learn the Sufi traditions of India, you would learn how Chisti saints were such a um, humble people who didn't like all this pompous life of sultans. So, mostly this Tughlaq and Nizamuddin Aliya, the one of the Sufi leaders, were not in good terms. So, Tughlaq sends a very threatening message to Aliya. Listening to this, the people in uh, Delhi comes to uh, Nizamuddin Aliya and tells him, please do something, this Gyasin Tughlaq is going to come back to Delhi and there's something bad which is going to happen. And Aliya, in his very calm mood, said in Persian, Hanus Dili Dur Ast. If we translate into something in Hindi, it would sound something like Abhe Hindi, Ab Dilli ke liye toh dur baki hai. Something of the sort. So, just before Gyasin Tughlaq wanted to enter into uh, Delhi, a wooden pandal fell on him and Gyasin Tughlaq died. And thereby enhancing the greatness of uh, the Sufi saint who was uh, Nizamuddin Aliya. Okay, uh, that's fun apart, but let's move on to the details of Tughlaq dynasty. The most important and a very crucial ruler at, in here is Muhammad bin Tughlaq. He's probably uh, the most controversial sultan in the Delhi Sultanate. People have different, different opinions about him. He's a man of paradox and some people even call him a wisest fool. Think of it, calling a person wise and fool simultaneously. So there's some things which he would have done which made people call him the wisest fool. So he experimented with many things and we'll be seeing what are the experiments that he did. Before we delve into his experiments, let's understand what sort of a person he was. He was a very, very secular person. Why? Because he celebrated almost all, all Hindu festivals. He also appointed Hindus as the revenue officers. In fact, Ziauddin Barni has heavily criticized him for that. Now, whether Barni is right, or wrong is a matter for a, a different day but interestingly what one conclusion we can all make is that he was a very secular person and think of it you here you are ruling over a o, 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 over a society who's predominantly hindu and if you're not respecting their culture and if you're not a very secular person i don't think you can be a very nice uh, administrator or a ruler right no okay again one more thing is that the actual name of muhammad bin khan bin tughlaq is jana khan so, during his time, he was visited by a lot of scholars. Jain Parabasuri, who was a Jain monk. Then Ibn Battuta, he was from Morocco. 
he from Tangier and he he's the author of the book Kitab ul Rahla. He was then made the Kazi of Delhi. Tell me what is Kazi? Do you remember El Tutmesh Majlis e Khalwat Kazi ul Kuzat? Yeah, that's right. Kazi means something to do with justice. So he was made the Chief Justice of Delhi. But then later he became in a wrong terms with uh, Muhammad bin Tughlaq and that's why uh, he was jailed. But later the misunderstanding went off and then he was made the ambassador to China. Okay, so this is about uh, Muhammad bin Tughlaq and we'll deal in with greater detail about the things that Muhammad bin Tughlaq has achieved or uh, what he tried to achieve. Thank you for listening. Have a nice day. Hello everyone and welcome to an academy. You're listening to the course Comprehensive Understanding of Delhi Sultanate, Bahmani Kingdom and Vijayanagara Empire. We are listening to lesson number 8 which is the policies of Muhammad bin Tughlaq or rather we should call it the experiments of Muhammad bin Tughlaq. It is presented by me Nitin Kunne Parambil. You can read more about me here. You also know the course fees in academy in an academy is nil. However, you are always welcome to make a voluntary contribution by clicking the contribute button. You can follow me in the link here. Okay, before we deal about the experiments of Muhammad bin Tughlaq let's take a quick recap till what had happened now so all started when Muhammad Ghor died in 1206 then from 1206 to 1210 you have Qutbuddin Aybak who was establishing the Mamluks dynasties then you have the Iltutmish who is going to rule long 26 years by doing a very big expansionary policy and then you have a puppet ruler who is called Naziruddin Shah who was controlled by Chalisa mainly Balban who was his wazir wazir was the prime minister after Naziruddin Shah dies Balban himself takes over the throne and he rules for another 20 years and this is the time when the consolidation of the empire starts then you have the khalji revolution for a brief period you have jalaluddin khalji who was assassinated by alauddin khalji who rules for almost 20 years and he has a very large army he does a very big expansionary policy to the south with the help of his commander malik kafur then you have mubarak khalji who destroys the game and then start the tughlaq dynasty tughlaq initially you have like 4 to 5 years of uh, giyasuddin tughlaq and finally we end up in the person mohammed bin tughlaq who is going to rule the throne in delhi for a very very long time for almost uh, 30 uh, 26 years and then uh, he also is famous for all his experiments so let's take it up one by one so mohammed bin tughlaq he is controversial for four main reasons the first one being the transfer of capital token currency introdu- introduction expedition to khorasan and taxation in doab so let's talk take one topic at a time the first one being the transfer of capital so the first thing you should come to your mind is where did he ca- shift his capital and from where from was obviously delhi delhi was a seat of power for almost all delhi sultan till the lodis and then he wanted to move to daulatabad where is daulatabad you remember this place which alauddin khalji has conquered from the uh, yadava king yeah this is the same devgiri which was renamed as daulatabad now why why did he do this so there are different theories for example ziauddin barni says that it was the center of his kingdom that might not be so perfectly true this yet another historian whose name is nizami he had recorded that people hated sultan and he wanted to move away from delhi but that seems very childish a thing to do for a sultan like mohammed bin tughlaq but the most scientific understanding of what could have happened is that unlike khaljis tughlaqs want to integrate south with the north you remember the uh, now the delhi sultanate is all the way beyond the vindhyas and is there all the way up till pandya which is madurai right and you have hoysalas which have fell you have um, um, uh, the kakatiyas who fell uh, you had all this um, virabellala pratap rudradeva Uh, sundar pandya veera pandya all these people right and then so that is one thing unlike khaljis you have tughlaqs who wanted to integrate south with north and deccan was a gateway to south so he thought might be you know shift to um deccan might be a very good idea but again he understood there's something fundamentally wrong there because the north was threatened by mongols so within two and a half years he shifts back to delhi 
So this has incurred financial loss, a lot of people died and many more things. But another interesting aftermath of the shift is that many of the nobles who shifted from Delhi to Deccan stayed back and made it their permanent home. Now, because of this, the southern culture had got a Persian influence. This will later develop into the Bahmanis. Right? The Bahmani of South can trace their history from the shift of capital from Delhi to Dalatabad by Muhammad bin Tughil. You keep this in mind and then we'll discuss about the same thing when we talk about the Bahmani kingdoms. Okay, fine. The another one is a significant contribution that Bahmani had made to the Urdu language. Even though Urdu is widely spoken in North, the Dakini Urdu was a special... Okay, we'll talk about it later when we come to uh, the Bahmani kingdoms. The second one was the expedition to the Khorasan. The Khorasan is a place somewhere west to India and then for attacking Khorasan, Muhammad bin Tughlaq raised a very huge army, paid them salary in cash for 3 lakh soldiers. Just think of it, 3 lakh soldiers, a very, very large army. But then he finally abandoned it. Why would he do that? That's why people call him vice as fool. But then they also fail to understand that the Central Asian dynamics are totally changed. Then he didn't consider why to invade Khorasan and incur an even bigger loss for uh, ourselves. There's man loss, there's material loss. So it was a very calculated move, but then people often mistake it to be one of the mistakes that um, Muhammad bin Tughlaq has taken. But the second one uh, is also about the expedition to Karachi, which is in Himachal, where he had sent 10,000 troops to suppress a revolt. But what he didn't know was the 10,000 troops that he sent had no idea about the guerrilla warfare. So what happened? Disease spread, a lot of issues were so scarce and they didn't complete in the correct time. So effectively only 10 out of the 10,000 people returned. So now this indeed was a mistake of Sultan himself. And the third one being the taxation in Doab. So what, as a very well-read scholarly person, Muhammad bin Tughlaq had this idea of what Alauddin Khalji has achieved. So probably he wanted to go back and experiment the way Alauddin Khalji had done. So which was to increase the Kharaj from 33% to 50%. But he had no idea of what was happening in the uh, in the Doab. Doab is a land between two rivers. Do Ab. If you have five rivers, it becomes Panch Ab. Right? Which are the five rivers in Punjab? Okay, write it down somewhere. Anyways, let's come to our topic. Because of this taxation, there was a huge unrest in Doab, mainly due to the drought. King wasn't aware of any of this. So the, what the peasants retaliated is that they set fire to their own crops and ran away into jungles. Now this is the, uh, what is a had, right? Even you push a man to that brim, only then will he do something like this, burning his own crops and running away. So this is what uh, the Sultan had done. So effectively, these are the very, very controversial topics which uh, Muhammad bin Tughlaq had got himself into. Uh, it would be interesting to note why he did that. Because mostly he was misinformed. He had a lot of great thoughts in his mind. But he could not make it into actions. So there was a clear mismatch between his thoughts and action. The more on Tughlaq, we'll discuss about it later. Thank you for listening. Have a nice day. Hello everyone and welcome to an academy. You're listening to a course on comprehensive understanding of Delhi Sultanate, Bahmani Kingdoms and Vijayanagara Empire. And this is the lesson number 9, which is the token currency system of Muhammad bin Tughlaq. The course is presented to you by Nitin Kune Parambal, that would be me. The details regarding me are given here. You should also know the unacademy courses are of course free of cost, but then if you would like to make a voluntary contribution, you are free to do so by clicking the contribute button. You can also follow me on the link given below. Okay, before we dwell into the details of Muhammad bin Tughlaq and his uh, um, token currency, let's take a quick recap of what had happened before. We spoke about Muhammad bin Tughlaq, how a very controversial figure that he was. It's basically because of four different experiments that he tried to do. The first one being a transfer of capital from Delhi to Dalitabad in Deccan. Then was the expedition to Khorasan and Karachi, And then there was a taxation in Doha which made him very unpopular and finally the token currency system. Now let's see the token currency system as introduced by Muhammad bin Tughlaq in detail. Just pause for a minute and open your purse and see for the money. You'd see it's all the paper money. 
in inherently the paper has no particular value right but the system somehow works what does it based on the answer to this the question is trust everybody trust that rbi uh, somehow will take care of everything they take trust uh, trust the government when it comes to mohammed bin tughlaq he had something of the similar thought in his mind he found that there's a utter lack of silver and which is really holding back the uh, economy so he thought why not introduce a token currency he had also got the same idea from the uh, chinese who had introduced a paper currency even then so instead of having tanka and jital which is usually uh, the copper and the silver coins what he tried to do is was he tried to introduce a brass currency so this is how it works one silver tanka was equal to 48 jital now he would try to introduce one silver tanka is equal to one jital uh, brass jital now this is where everyone turned uh, very chaotic in nature because people didn't quite appreciate the concept of token currency instead what had happened is that people started minting their own currency in fact ziauddin barani had quoted that every hindu household had turned into a mint why hindu household because most of the smiths were hindus hence what happened you had a large number of coins which has was just circulating in the market if you remember the classic economic definition of inflation it's too many cash chasing too few goods that's exactly what happened hence you have hyperinflation in the sultanate which had affected the trade external trade and full of chaos and finally uh, this system had to be repealed also let's speak about the steps taken by mohammed bin tughlaq uh, we had spoken about how uh, taxation in doab was a disaster so for that he had established diwane kohi diwane amir kohi they are all the same he also extended loans to farmers he set up lands for the research even though it failed it shows how important a visionary that he was he also encouraged the production of cash crops now let's take a moment that now that we have understood the different aspects of uh, the polity of mohammed bin tughlaq let's take up some minute and understand what sort of a person he was he indeed was a man before his time also he had great ideas but then there's a great mislink between his ideas and his actions because the system was not ready for it and he didn't have enough infrastructure to implement it most of the people hated sultan for it imagine you have hyperinflation let's say dal is 200 rupees a kilo for like years together or like your rice is always the price is very high obviously you're going to hate the government at that particular day right the same thing is happening here people hated sultan in fact this is very beautifully recorded by most of the historians including barani and ibn batuta but then in no way can we call a visionary like him a fool in fact ibn batuta records in rahla that but his distinguished character was a liberty so marvelous that the like has never been reported in any predecessors that means he was such a big visionary okay now we move on to the next king of the um, tughlaq dynasty and that would be firoz shah tughlaq now what did firoz shah tughlaq inherit so firoz shah tughlaq who was the cousin of uh, mohammed bin tughlaq inherited a broken uh, treasury a uh, unruly people and full of chaotic system so for that what he had done is that he introduced a lot of new policies which tried to reverse uh, the mistakes done by mohammed bin tughlaq but he always regarded his cousin with great regard for in fact for that matter he established a new city and named it jaunpur you should remember that mohammed bin tughlaq's actual name is jauna khan so to commemorate him he had uh, set up a new city called as jaunpur okay our historical understanding about firoz shah tughlaq comes from these texts tarikh e firoz shahi we had spoken about it ziauddin barni and then ifatwa e jahangir uh, jahandari which is also written by uh, ziauddin barni who speaks about the victories of firoz shah he is always regarded as a welfare king but he is also controversial for his religious policy and also considered to be the key reason why the sultanate declined now why is he called as a welfare king he built in numerous number of canals for irrigation mainly in satluj and yamuna in fact most of the um, canals which feed the delhi city even now uh, was built by firoz shah tughlaq he also built hospitals it was called shifa khana if you know a bit of arabic uh, you would understand that shifa always refers to something called the health 
in Kerala we have a, a hospital whose, whose name is Al Shifa, right? Which so Shifa and Shifa Kana. Does it make sense? Okay. <laughs> now uh, he also uh, spoke about different uh, type of irrigation where he had introduced uh, taxation for irrigation. It was called Hak a Shirb, and uh, the tax for the irrigation was made. Uh, uh, 10 percentage because somehow he had to finance this building of canals right so that it makes perfect sense that he tax the irrigation he also built yatim khana tell me what is yatim khana yatim means often so yatim khana would be orphanage he also built widow homes he also constructed marriage bureaus employment bureaus and many more things so in fact he was a very well known for welfare uh, activities that he took upon but then the way he engaged ulema is very controversial because he started collecting jasiya. Jasiya is what you remember what we spoke about kharaj, khams, uh, jasiya, and zakat. Jasiya is a tax from non Hindus. So he started collecting jasiya from all of them, which kind of made uh, him a very unpopular person because he made ulema the persons in charge for collecting jasiya. Okay, then also he's uh, um, known for how he had attacked Hindu temples like Jawala Devi temple in Himachal Pradesh. He also banned the female entry to shrines of Sufi saints. Sufi saints as we know were very liberal people. They had no gender bias. But then the, here is a Sultan who uh, restricted the entry of women into the shrines of Sufis. He also banned some of the Muslim festivals like Shab, uh, Shabib Erat uh, which under the influence of Ulema. In fact, there was one Brahman who tried to convert a Muslim to Hinduism, back to Hinduism. So what our uh, Firosha Tughlaq did was he burnt a Brahman alive. Now for a Hindu society at that point of time, this was called as Brahmahatya, one of the uh, worst po possible crimes, though it doesn't make that big a difference. Uh, that's exactly what uh, had happened because there's huge amount of animosity now against uh, Sultan's religious policy. Also, if you could just speak about the future dynasties, there are Sayyid so coming in 1414 to 1452. Uh, that's just after uh, the Timur's invasion of Delhi. We'll speak about it. And finally, we have Bahlo Lodis. Lodis, which were the, who were the first Pathan kings. Pathan uh, are the Afghanis. And they're the first Pathan kings. And one, Mr., one Bahlo Lodi uh, was the uh, founder of the dynasty. And then uh, you have Sikandar Lodi, who builds a capital in Agra. And finally, you have Ibrahim Lodi, who gets beaten in the battle of Panipat by Babur. Uh, that's it for the lecture today. Uh, see you in the next lecture. Have a nice day. Thank you. Hello, everyone, and welcome to an academy. You're listening to a course on comprehensive understanding of Delhi Sultanate, Bahmani Kingdom, and Vijayanagara Empire. And this would be lesson number 10, which speaks about the decline of the Delhi Sultanate and the emergence of regional kingdoms. The course is presented to you by Nitin Kune Parambal. That would be me. You can read more about me here. You, you should know by now that the courses in an academy are free of cost. But if you would like to make a voluntary contribution, you're free to do so by clicking the contribute button given here. Also, you can follow me in the link given here. Okay. Now, we had spoken for the past nine lectures about how great things Delhi Sultanate had achieved their various administrative policies. You had seen probably for 300 uh, to 400 years how they dominated the space of uh, the northern plains. But then it failed like any other th uh, system it failed. But what were the reasons which led to the collapse or decline of Delhi Sultanate? The first thing was the inherent weakness. So it, autocracy was not uh, definitely not a a, a very powerful uh, system to govern people you've seen roman empire which failed we've seen alexander which failed you see the mauryan ashokan empire which failed guptas failed mughals failed british uh, even though it is an empire uh, in, in the modern sense it also failed why because it lacked popular participation it was a power of sword which uh, commanded the great heights so obviously that system was inherently weak and second one, the absence of a strong rule. What, what do I mean by that? Post Firosha Tughlaq, most of the real rulers were very weak and they couldn't exert that amount of power which is needed for autocracy. So therefore, it had to fail. And next, 
if you can speak about unenlightened policies of many sultans, especially Firoz Shah Tughlaq and Ulema, how he engaged Ulema, how there was huge amount of animosity. We did speak about it in the previous lectures as well, but we'll touch upon it in a greater detail. And also we can speak about the mistakes of Mohammed bin Tughlaq. You saw how uh, economy was shattered by his uh, war expenses, like his uh, um, at Khorasan expedition, how his token currency had totally failed the system, how taxation in Doab had totally failed the system, how his uh, shifting of capital from Delhi to Dalatabad has failed the system. So by the end of uh, uh, Muhammad bin Tughlaq, it was a very chaotic situation, which Firoz Tughlaq did try to uh, adjust for 30, 30 plus years, but he was failed to do it in a complete sense. And much more than that, there was something called as an attack by Timur. You would hear about Timurids. This attack on Delhi by Timur in 1398 is very important because in 1526 when Babur attacks Delhi, he claims that he has a legal right on Delhi because Timur, his grandfather, had already captured Delhi. So it's a very interesting thing. We'll speak about it. And also we'll speak about the popular support. Now you should understand that this system was not based on the popular support, rather it was based on the military support. So if when the military becomes weak, the Sultanate by natural extension has to become weak. And this led to the emergence of many regional kingdoms. Okay, now let's talk about the influence of Ulema on administration. Uh, Firoz Shah Tughlaq, as we remember, had uh, introduced jazia, a tax for the non-Muslims. So this was seen as a very big mistake and how he gave a free run for the ulema. In fact, Dr. Yuan De has observed that his supplification to the ulemas only encouraged a group of unscrupulous, selfish people to behave arrogantly and pose themselves as a custodian of Mus Muslim consciousness. All these combined to create a situation which disintegration became inevitable. What does this mean? It means that, you know, how uh, the ulema had become an important reason for the decline of the Sultanate. Also, when you speak about Firoz Shah Tughlaq, he gave a lot of power to his nobles. So when these nobles became super powerful, they had their own interest and they had state interest. And when their interest was against the larger interest of the state, they pronounced independence. And like, for example, we, we did speak about this place called as Jaunpur. Now, Jaunpur later became a regional kingdom. Why is that so? Because the people who ruled the Sharki kingdom had their own interest. We'll speak about it uh, when we speak about, uh, I mean, you'll hear about it when you hear the architecture uh, in in, uh, um, in the medieval era about Sharki kingdom and how their architecture was uniquely different. Okay, and now uh, this is the way we can summarize the uh, de decentralization policy and the downfall of dynasty by Sir Wolseley Haig. He has written that his system of decentralization accelerated the downfall of dynasty, which is but natural because it this promotes the provincial system of governance. Okay, now what happens if you bite something which is far heavy for you to chew? That's exactly what had happened during Tughlaq's time. If you remember how Alauddin Khalji and Mal Malik Kafur had uh, integrated south to their kingdom. They didn't do a direct integration, rather they relied on, con on tributes. But what did Tughlaq do? Tughlaq came all the way till Devgiri or Daltabad so that he could administer south properly. So this integration of south with north had led him uh, one of the biggest problems. right? And so now this miscommunication between Delhi to deep south, let's say Madurai, was inevitable that you know this system collapses. So, because of that, we have the rise of provincial governors. Okay, so basically, they had a very big empire which they couldn't govern. So, obviously, it had to fail some point or the other. Now, to sum it up, let's see what are the other regional kingdoms that you have in uh, in India. First, you have the Sultanate itself. So, it's then the basically the Gangetic plain. Then Bengal uh, becomes a new uh, provincial center. Gujarat becomes a new provincial center. But what is more interesting for us is in the south. In Deccan, you have Bahmanis who are going to rule for a very long time. And then you also have Vijayanagara Empire. So these two are of great concerns for us uh, as, with respect to this exam. 
and also because they left significant imprint in the southern history so we'll be talking about them in the next lectures thank you for listening have a nice day hello friends welcome to an academy and you're listening to a course on comprehensive understanding of delhi sultanate bahmani kingdom and vijayanagara empire right now we are going to see the 11th chapter which is the vijayanagara empire and this is presented to you by me nitin kunne parambil and this would be about me as you know the courses on an academy are absolutely free but then if you want to give uh, your token of appreciation to us please click the contribute button and um, make a contribution also you can follow me on an academy in this link so uh, before jumping into the vijayanagara empire per se let's see what had happened previously we had spoken about the rise and fall of sultans of delhi we saw two particular dynasties in the delhi sultans which were khaljis and tughlaqs who had exceptional interest in south we also saw the difference between their uh, attitude to south for example alauddin khalji and his commander maluk kafur when they invited south invaded south they wanted to keep them as a place where from they can collect tribute that's it they didn't want to successfully integrate south with the north but then mohammed bin tughlaq on other hand he wanted to integrate south with north that's exactly why he shifted his capital from delhi to daulatabad right because deccan was the doorway to the south with this in mind let's come and you have a rough idea of the timeline as well you're talking about 1296 to 1316 when it comes to uh the uh um alauddin khalji and you're talking about a rough pace between uh, 9, 1325 to 1351 but you should also remember this is a time when there was a huge economic loss khorasan experiment lot of problems in north as well with this in mind let's go a bit further okay before uh persis starting this vijayanagara empire why should one learn it if you have listened to dr swami's speech on vijayanagara empire you would understand that the vijayanagara empire and the heritage that it holds is a cornerstone to the hindu pride in our country whether you like it or not an objective understanding about vijayanagara empire is imperative to understand what the subramanya swami speaks also it is also important this is exactly why history is important to us today history is never past right okay with this understanding of the importance and the gravity of the issue in mind let's jump into the topic to start with there were two people harihara and bukaraya who were feudatories of one kampilaraya because of the conquest of mohammed bin tughlaq they were taken to delhi and they were converted to islam during the big chaotic situation of mohammed bin uh, tughlaq they came back and they reconverted to hinduism and along with their guru madhava vidyaranna vidyaranya they established the new empire and that empire name is vijayanagara which is named after their guru <laughs> very strange right uh, you've seen this uh, guru and shishya co- combination a lot like uh, uh, chanakya and his uh, student what's his name chandragupta maurya that's right and you see alexander and his guru there are a lot of people uh, where this guru shishya combination had played out well and this is yet, yet another example and their capital was on banks of river hump uh, in, in in banks of river tungabhadra and the capital's name was hampi i recently have been there it's a beautiful place if you get any chance to visit karnataka make sure you spare two three days and visit hampi okay anyways uh, tungabhadra is also called as pampa it is not to be confused with the river which uh, flows in kerala there's a totally different pampa but tungabhadra also has a name called as pampa and that's why hum, uh, hampi or tunga um, vijayanagara empire is also called as pampa kshetra okay now there are four different dynasties which ruled vijayanagara empire the first one is sangama obviously harihara and buka used to belong to sangama saluva the second one third one tuluva tuluva is our uh, krishna devaraya who was the most famous king of this uh, dynasty and then finally aravidu this is the latter half which uh, flees to uh, tirupati fearing the uh, attack of bahmanis okay and um, so we know that uh, this was uh, established by uh, harihara and buka and is often referred to as a hindu state but was it actually a brahmanical state the answer would be no 
it was a very secular state like most of the successful kingdoms in india if they want to thrive they cannot afford to be uh, acting in the partisan interest rather they have to always act in larger uh, secular interest obviously there is going to be hues of uh, hindu element and the brahmanical culture which will be dominating in vijayanagara but then it can never 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 be said as a brahmanical state in fact they had recruited a large number of muslims are the archers because vijayanagara did it their rivals who were the bahmani kingdoms they also employed large number of hindus in their administration and also in the army so basically there's only one line of explanation that religion was a political tool even now you see all this issue that we see uh, right now as religion has often been used as a political tool rather than understanding what the religion has to preach finally um, how do we know about uh, vijayanagara did they leave a, a very rich history <laughs> indians has been always very bad at writing history but then what our little we know about or what our much that we know about has a lion share which is um, attributed to the travelers who came to vijayanagara at that point of time nicolio nicolo conti who was an italian who visited vijayanagara during the emperor uh, devaraya then abdur razak was a arabic traveler who came and visited vijayanagara during devaraya too then you have domingo pes who was a portuguese who visited during krishna devaraya uh, duarte barbosa who was again a portuguese who visited uh, during krishna devaraya and fernando nunes who was italian who visited during krishna devaraya now one important thing that you cannot a mess here is the importance of krishna dev raya here right so we'll be speaking about krishna dev raya in the coming lessons thank you for listening have a nice day welcome to an academy and you're listening to a course on comprehensive understanding of delhi sultanate bahmani kingdom and vijayanagara empire right now we are in the second part when it comes to the discussion on vijayanagara empire and the chapter is lesson number 12 which is the administration and the society of vijayanagara empire this course is presented by nitin kunne parambal that is me you can read about me here as you all know the course on an academy are absolutely free but if you want to uh, show your piece of appreciation towards the work that we do for you guys please click the contribute button and uh, be generous in your contributions okay you can also follow me on uh, the a link given below a quick recap what had happened in the previous lessons we have also spoken about uh, the conditions of uh, the northern india we spoke about the establishment of vijayanagara empire we also spoke about the four different dynasties which is sangama salava tuluva and arvidu and we had a passing by remark on krishna devaraya who drain witnessed witnessed a lot of foreign travelers but needless to say he was the greatest ruler um, in the vijayanagara empire itself in in the four dynasties and he belonged to the tuluva uh, dynasty okay let's uh, speak about krishna dev raya in a bit more detail way he, as i said he was the greatest of all because uh, uh, there was high amount of economic progress they had lot of ports riverine ports which made him great um, and not just because of that there were other issues as well uh, we'll talk about it babar had mentioned about krishna dev raya in his autobiography which is tuzuke baburi and in which he had said that krishna dev raya probably could be the richest king in the world uh, I, as i said i also visited uh, hampi recently uh, some 2 3 weeks ago and what i found was they had a very very elaborate city and uh, i was googling through it and i found that this probably could be the second largest city at that point of time after beijing see how important is that is like it's very very big than paris at that point of time anyways uh, much more than that krishna dev raya also patronized the telugu language and why is it important telugu it's a part of telugu pride as well most of them say this thing um desha bhasha lo telugu lasa that means of all the languages which were spoken in vijayanagara empire which could probably be tulu it could be uh, kannada it could be malayalam it could be tamil it could be telugu and of all these languages telugu is said to be the sweetest in fact nicola conti himself has called telugu as the italian of the east now why is it so telugu most of the words are ending with a vowel sound you know endaro mahanu bavulu that means you know every word ending with u similarly with uh, uh, italian as well you know ciao these are all italian words right pasta all these words are like ending with vowels so similarly of that sort also he had something called as ashtadigaja ashtadigaja the eight important personalities mainly poets right advices to the king 
and uh, out of which one important figure that everyone should be knowing would be the Tenali Raman and also Allah Sharif Adinna. You can Google on details of uh, Ashtadi Gajas. But Krishna Dev Rai himself was a great um, um, literator because he wrote two important work, Amukya Malyada, which speaks about the administrator, which is like, more like Arthashastra of uh, Kautilya and Jambavati Kalyan. Okay, now let's speak about the administration in the Vijayanagara Empire. Vijayanagara Empire had a very centralized administration with king on the top. King was also called as Bhoja in this, in this, in this regard. The king was assisted by a Brahmin Mantri Parishad and also this Mantri Parishad had the assistance of Satchivalaya. Now, if you see uh, the geographical divisions, like we had Ikta, Ashik, Pargana, Gaon, similar to that, the Vijayanakra Empire also divided their uh, total land into Rajya or Mandalam. Mandalam were further divided into Valanadu, then Valanadu into Nadu, then to Melgramam and Gramam. So these are the divisions. So Vijayanagara kingdom, Rajya or Mandalam, then Valanadu, then Nadu, then Melgramam, then Gram. So what is with this Rajya or Mandalam? It is usually governed by a prince and he had a lot of autonomy. He could issue coins, he could add taxes and the king also had the right to transfer these governors so that they don't become provincially very uh, concentrated there. Now, we, if, there's a startling difference between the Vijayanagara Empire and the Chola. The Chola is the village enjoyed a lot more freedom. There's something called a segmented state theory. Uh, that's a very higher uh, historical understanding. But as for now, you can know that Chola villages had a lot of autonomy. But Vijayanagara villages didn't enjoy that amount of autonomy. Okay. With this in mind, let's go to the Nayaka system. Now, what is Nayaka? If you have heard about the Madhuri Meenakshi temple, you have seen how beautiful it is. That's all attributed to the Nayaka architecture. So this all traces from this Vijayanagara concept. Now Vijayanagara people had Nayaka system. They were basically feudal lords who used to govern a lot of places in their respective um, rajams. So they also had something called the Amara Nayaka. Amara Nayaka were the military officers who were given land in lieu of the salary. Similar to our Iktidar and later when we go to uh, Mughals, you'll speak about uh, uh, the Jagirdars and the Mansabdars, right? The same system uh, Vijayanagara people also had. They had Amara Nayaka. Amara Nayaka slowly became hereditary and, became, and uh, it was the strongest under Krishna Devaraya who was supposed to have 200, 200 or so Amara Nayaka. Okay, now come to society. Needless to say, they had a very strong Brahminical influence. Because they were basically a Hindu kingdom and it was the Brahmins who legitimized a lot of rule of kings, right, in the Hindu society. A good lot of their portion of their tax went to, um, not good lot, uh, some portion of their tax went to temples and priests. That means temples are happy, the priests were happy, the Brahmins were happy, right. And the monopoly of education was around the temples. That means the upper caste male was always given important when it comes to education, which probably happens like in everywhere in India. Also, temples in south were very distinct from the temples from north. Temples in south were the center of economic activity. That's the center of education, the center of uh, dance form, the center of uh, probably all economic transactions. Hence, temples were super important. If you go to Hampi, you'd see in small area, probably of like, you know, if you say one acre of area, you'll probably have 200 to 300 temples. That shows how important temples were. Temples uh, had large, were the largest employers, People work, it also worked as banks because of all the money they get, they used to loan it. That means you can do business with it, the economic activity booms and you know, the growth goes on. It was also important for dance, drama, music and weavers. If you know about Carnatic music a bit, there's this great person called as Purandara Dasa, who had supposedly come to the Vithala temple of uh, Vijayanagara and had performed there. Okay, uh, that's about the society and the temple. Uh, it's very interesting to know if you uh, read the temple architecture when it comes to the art and culture topic of UPC uh, preparations. You'll also hear about the Kalyana Mandapa. Kalyana Mandapa in Malayalam and Kalyana Mandapa actually translate into the marriage hall. So Kalyana Mandapa was always associated with the temple. Itself. Now, why is this important? Do people get married there? <laughs> no, it is a Devata and Devi who used to get married there. So that's Kalyana Mandapa is a very interesting concept in uh, Vijayanagara Empire architecture. 
Now let's talk about women. Now condition of women was relatively better. Why? Because there was no parda system as practiced uh, in north. In north, it was very common, especially the Rajputs. Uh, you never had a polygamy. Uh, I mean, you always had polygamy. Like most of the places in India, uh, men used to marry more than one wife, so that is called as polygamy, which is very prevalent here. The society was not open for the idea of widow remarriage, but the state was open to the idea. How do you know that? Because the marriages were taxed in Vijayanagara Empire. But had it been a widow marriage, there was no tax for it. So that means state is indirectly helping or promoting the widow remarriage. Okay. The practice of sati was recorded, uh, which was probably true in most of the places in, uh, um, in India. And also, it is said that the male guards committed suicide on the pyre of the Lord. I don't know what inference we should uh, take from it, but then it's one interesting observation. Please do record it. And child marriage was not unknown definitely there would have been child marriage as well so uh, that's it with for vijayanagara empire uh, i hope you enjoyed it uh, i'll see you with bamini kingdoms the next week thank you have a nice day hello everyone welcome to an academy and you are listening to a course on comprehensive understanding of delhi sultanate bamini kingdom and vijayanagara empire and this would be the last among the series uh, in this course and that is the discussion on Bamini kingdoms who ruled uh, the Deccan area from 1347 to 1680s. And this course is presented to you by Nitin Kunne Parambal, that is me. You can read about me in this uh, slide. Also, as you know, the courses on an academy are absolutely free, but you are allowed to make a voluntary contribution, how much of money you like, to as a your piece of appreciation to the, all the hard work all these educators are doing for you. You can also follow me in the link given below. Okay, before we delve into uh, the Bamini kingdoms, we have also seen about the rise and fall of sultans in Delhi. You spoke about the southern interest of Khaljis and Tughlaqs. We spoke about their attitude towards south, how one wanted to integrate, the other wanted to keep it as an extended part of their uh, kingdom, um, especially the Alauddin Khalji and Muhammad bin Tughlaq. We also spoke about Vijayanagara, how they were a very flourishing uh, empire down in the south. So, before coming to uh, Bamini kingdom, the five kingdoms, let's understand the, in, the basic structure of how the Bamini's came into existence. You remember Muhammad bin Tughlaq, I think we had put a pause there when we were discussing Muhammad bin Tughlaq. When Muhammad bin Tughlaq shifted his capital from Delhi to Dalatabad, a lot of nobles came along with them and they made Deccan their permanent home. So, once Muhammad bin Tughlaq was weak, if you see it is in 1340s that Muhammad bin Tughlaq is getting weaker, that's when the legional people start asserting their force and then Alauddin Hassan Bahman Shah, he along with his Guru Gangu founds the, uh, the Bahman kingdoms. So few important rulers to be seen are Feroz Shah Bahman. He's a very, very important ruler. Why? Because he was a multi he was a polyglot. He could speak Arabic. He could speak Persian. He could speak Telugu. He could speak Marathi. He could speak Kannada. Probably everything which is required to rule Deccan. Right? Also, he established an observatory in Daltabad and one interesting historical observation is that how his foreign policy worked, how he married Devraya first daughter to establish peace in Deccan. And second important person is Ahmad Shah Wali. He was a Sufi saint, he uh, was of an Sisti Silsila, he shifted his capital from Gulbarga to Bidar. Now why is Gulbarga? Um, can you tell me what is the new name of Gulbarga? How Bangalore became Bengaluru? How Mangalore became Mangaluru? How Thumkur became Thumkuru? What did Gulbarga become? All my Kannadiga friends might be knowing it. It is Kalaburgi. Okay. Anyways, he shifted the capital from Gulbarga to Bidar. And the third important person is Muhammad Gawan. Muhammad Gawan was not a Sultan. Rather, he was a de facto Sultan. How is it? How Balban was the de facto ruler under Nazirudin Shah. Muhammad Shah's rule saw a, a, a Divan, a Wazir called as Muhammad Gawan who ruled in name of Mamasha, if you see uh, our Game of Thrones, it is something like uh, the hand of the king, right? <laughs> okay, moving ahead. Muhammad Gawan was a very important person. Why? He was a wazir of Muhammad Shah III. He divided the empire into eight provinces. That means he really knew how to administer. He knew how smaller states are better governed, how smaller provinces are better governed. He built a madrasa. This madrasa was called as Muhammad Gawan Madrasa. He, during his time, he witnessed two important forces in the courts of Bahman sultans. The first one, Deccanese. Deccanese are the people 
how Dakshin become Dakkan, right? So Dakkanis are the people who are locals and they are also Afakis. Afakis are the northerners. Now were basically Afghanis, the Turki or the people from north who shifted from Delhi to Daltabad. So these two people used to fight a lot. And hence it was very important for these two people to get rid of Muhammad Gavan. And there's a very big story for it. I'm not getting into it. But then finally what happens is that 1482 men, Muhammad Gavan dies. And that's when the empire splits up into five different kingdoms. So that was an inevitable split because there were a lot of conflict of interest among the different pressure groups. And they didn't want to stay together. Right? So it became Bijapur, Bidar, Berar, Ahmednagar, and Golconda. And the corresponding uh, kingdoms associated with them are Bijapur were Adil Shahi kingdom, Bidar with Barid Shahi, Berar with Imad Shahi, Ahmednagar with Nizam Shahi, and Golconda with Qutub Shahi. So the, here I've given you a map wherein you see in 1400s, the whole five of them are together. So you can see Bamnis as one single group, who's bridged between Khandesh and Vijayanagara from the south. Now, if you see in 1500s, because 14, 1880s, uh, Muhammad Gavan is dying and it splits up. And thereby you have Bijapur towards the western coast, Golconda to the eastern coast. And you have Bidar, a sandwich between Bidar and Golconda. And you have Berar in the north. And you have Ahmednagar again in the uh, north of uh, Bijapur. Okay, now there's a very big fight which is happening, constantly happening during this era. Now, why did they fight for? They fought among each other and they also fought with Vijayanagara. Why did they fight for? That's for Raichur Doab because very rich, fertile land. If you see the uh, accounts of Niccolo Conti and all how he speaks, the river and port, ports, the ports on the river of Vijayanagara was so rich and how they transported a lot of things and like uh, the Southeast Asian Persian, the, the Persians, the Arab, uh, the Arab, the Arabs. All of them used to come, Portuguese, all used to come to uh, south of India to do their rich trade, right? Again, again. so it is Raichur Doha, Krishna, Godavari Delta and Marathwada. So for these three points, these all Vijayanagara fought with uh, Vijayanagara and the Bahmanis all fought with each other. But finally what happened is that in 1565, the, there's a confederation of Bahmanis, except there are the four others. Who are they? Bidar, Golconda, Ahmednagar and Bidar, uh, Golconda, Ahmednagar and uh, uh, um, Bijapur. All, all these four people get together except Berar and they attack Vijayanagara and in battle of uh, Talikota, Banihati and Rakshas Tangri, they de defeat Vijayanagara. In fact, they clearly destroy the capital city of Hampi. Recently, I have been there in Hampi, so I had seen how difficult, with great difficulties, they had uh, destroyed the city, how the temples were are destroyed how they uh, put fire on everything and how they could remove the dome it's a very difficult thing but why do you think these people destroyed hampi city wasn't it very beautiful how, why would they destroy it that's a very economic interest right just think of it now if you destroy a city that means there's nobody who's coming to city with their produce that means a trade suffers that means the tax for the government suffers that means the government can never raise a very big army right so it's because of the strategic importance that the Bami would have uh, destroyed Hampi, not for any other reason. But what would happen to this um, Bahmanis themselves? They're going to be consumed by the Mughals, especially when you come about, talk about Aurangzeb. He had a very special interest in Deccan. See how his Makbara, his Bivika Makbara, all of this are situated in, uh, uh, in Deccan, right? So that means uh, Aurangzeb had a very special interest in Deccan. So they're going to be consumed by uh, Mughals at a later point of time. Now, what are the contributions of uh, Bahmanis to Indian society? First one would be the Urdu language itself. Now, uh, we would have spoken about how Urdu originated in Delhi, but the truth is that Urdu uh, has a different variant called as a Deccani Urdu. The Deccani Urdu was popularized uh, by the Bahmani sultans, especially there's this person called as Kulu Kutub Shah, Kuli Kutub Shah, who's an Urdu poet whose work on Divan, Divan e Kutub Shahi is super important and how he uh, uh, wrote in Urdu. Also, when you speak about Wali Dakani, Wali had uh, popularized Urdu in the 17th century in South, basically. Now you heard about Gol Gumbas, which is the largest dome in India, was built by Adil Shah kingdoms, again, uh, South. So these are all the cultural contributions of uh, Bahmanis. But much more than that, now we have a very clear intermixing of North and South and Turkish and Arabic. All this influence is coming to North of, uh, in South of India.
which is very clearly reflected if you see the northern karnataka has a very strong hindi influence they really appreciate hindi they watch hindi movies at the same time if you go to Ka southern karnataka that is like all this mangaluru udupi all this belt that's devoid of hindi more like uh, like kerala or tamil nadu so you can clearly demarcate the uh, in cultural influence from the north okay that's how we come to an end of this course um, but let's conclude what had happened here so this is a very interesting phase of indian history it's less celebrated most of the time when people speak about medieval india people go and go about uh, mughals but then very interesting link between what had happened in the rajput era and what is going to happen in the mughal era is this particular phase that we have discussed so uh, all of this empires had to go somewhere or the other we spoke about how delhi sultans failed and we'll also see how mughals failed how guptas failed all of this has to fail some day or the other because it is all autocracy and i don't think it's a very stable system when compared to democracy i hope you have benefited from this video uh, please let me know about your comments whether you liked it or not i wish you all the best have a nice day thank you very much